Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the Mediterranean Pavilion. Um, and this evening session is all about transport, sustainable mobility, um, and transforming the way we move and building the future of mobility in the Mediterranean region. Um, so, welcome everyone. We're first going to start off the session just with a short video. Okay, well, I think that, that video was really intended to show a real positive view of the kind of transformation that, that transport can make in the Mediterranean region and all over the world, in fact. And it's a transformation that needs to happen. Um, if we're going to make the, um, the pledges and, and have a, a world that is Paris aligned, then tra transport, mobility, the way we move has really got to change quite dramatically. Um, and today we've got a, a great panel of, of, um, of contributors that really talk about what could happen, what are the really nice stories that are already showing the successes and the benefits of a more sustainable way of moving around the world. So, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to quickly go to our, our first um, contributor today um, who's um, online. There you are. Good morning. Um, good, uh, good evening, Francis. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome indeed to the panel. So Frances Carbonell is Head of Sector um, for Transport and Urban Development at the Union for the Mediterranean. So you're going to kick off the session for us in, in your beautiful pavilion here. Um, and so you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, good evening, everyone, or maybe also good afternoon or good morning for those uh, following on, on streaming. Uh, your participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish to, to begin by saying that it is uh, a pleasure for me to be able to address to you on this occasion. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, both the UITP and the UIC, for, for inviting us, for having us, the UFM Secretariat, to take part in this uh, event uh, in the uh, COP27 Met Pavilion. Uh, and it's also an honor for me to be able to share this uh, podium, uh, albeit virtually, uh, with uh, such relevant uh, global stakeholders, uh, as the ECLEI, uh, Local Governance for Sustainability, and the QOB Group. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as, as you may already know, the uh, Union for the Mediterranean, the UFM, is an intergovernmental organization that brings together 42 countries, including the 27 member states of the European Union and 15 non-EU member states in North Africa, the Middle East, the Western Balkans, and uh, Turkey. The UFM is a platform for dialogue and cooperation based on consensus building and it is also a multilateral partnership which aims at uh, increasing the potential for regional integration and cohesion among its member countries. Uh, it does so by enhancing co-ownership uh, of the process, setting governance on the basis of equal footing and translating it into concrete policy agendas and development projects in our priority sectors, among which is uh, sustainable transport uh, and uh, mobility. 
uh, within the framework of our dialogue structures so with the countries uh, we are, uh, which are co-chaired by the European Union and, and Jordan, we have now finalized the uh, preparatory work uh, for the next uh, UFM ministerial conference on transport. And, and one of the key deliverables expected to be endorsed by UFM ministers of transport is the new regional transport action plan for the Mediterranean region until uh, 2027. Uh, we call it uh, RTAP. Uh, we'll try to uh, share some, some visuals. Uh, hope it works. Uh, can you see the uh, presentation? So we can see that fine. Yeah, OK, thank you. So uh, the new, uh, this uh, new uh, regional uh, transport action plan, the RTAP, aims to assist uh, UFN countries and, and provides uh, comprehensive guidance for action covering uh, all transport modes. Uh, that is inland transport modes, such as road, railways, and urban transport, but also maritime transport and civil aviation. Uh, the overall goal of the uh, RTAP is to support the development of a safe, secure, sustainable, efficient, and connected transport system in, in the region. Uh, the drafting exercise of this action plan has been a collaborative and co owned effort by all UFM member states, and the plan is now validated at technical level by our member countries. It was validated in May 2022 and is now ready for adoption uh, at the political level. Today, uh, Given the sectoral scope of this session and, and also of our organizers and, and panelists, I will focus on how these new RTAP measures uh, targeting urban mobility can scale up uh, against uh, action against climate change. Uh, but before going through these measures, allow me to quickly recall the uh, conceptual framework structuring and, and guiding them. The uh, conceptual framework, which is which some or most of you may already know is the so-called avoid, shift, improve, or ASI approach. Um, the ASI approach has been and is central to unleashing the full benefits of sustainable low carbon transport. It calls for uh, avoiding uh, unnecessary motorized streets based on proximity and accessibility, uh, shifting the, to less carbon intensive modes, and also improving uh, vehicle uh, design, energy efficiency, and clean energy sources for different types of freight and, and passenger vehicles. In terms of its impact on scaling up action on climate change, uh, sorry, there is uh, growing evidence uh, that showing that avoidance shift strategies can account for 50, 40 to 60 percent of transport emission reductions at lower costs than improved strategy. However, the updated uh, nationally determined contributions uh, and disease uh, under the Paris agreements continue to focus strongly on improved measures. So 52 percent of all measures are improved measures in the NDCs. And shift and avoid measures account for only 38 percent and 10 percent uh, respectively. So there seems uh, to be a need to refocus on, on the uh, ASI framework. Uh, there are ongoing reflections on this, but I leave it here and maybe we could come back to this during or after the, uh, the panel discussions. And uh, I will not dwell on, on, on either on, on the, the uh, measures you can see on the screens, the examples of the three types of approaches of the uh, ASI uh, framework, uh, because I'll try to stick to the time that I've been given uh, for my presentation. So without uh, further ado, allow me to quickly present under this ASI perspective, the uh, priority measures that our member states have jointly identified in the uh, new uh, RTAP in order to promote sustainable climate friendly and climate resilient urban mobility in the coming years until 2027 and most likely also beyond that date. So first, uh, countries have agreed that on the need to establish or continue to implement uh, national urban mobility policies and sustainable urban mobility plans as part of a comprehensive and integrated approach, starting by, by the most important cities. And in this context, countries can draw, for instance, on the European Union's guidelines on the development and implementation of sustainable urban mobility plans. 
Second, countries need to ensure coordination between transportation plans and land use plans, which will make it possible to achieve the expected objective by providing long-term solutions uh, to the problems of population growth, urban sprawl, increased commuting times and, and car uh, dependency, uh, among others. And also complementarity between the different transport modes must be ensured. Uh, the interaction between several public transport modes, multimodal travel, and its impact on urban transport network design, accessibility, and the proper use of urban areas will have a positive act, impact on urban mobility. And in this context, all modes of transport, in particular non-motorized travel, walking and cycling, should be uh, encouraged. Third, there's a need to support better governance on, on urban mobility, mainly through the creation of transport authorities, among other reasons to ensure the uh, coordination that I just mentioned. Fourth, the establishment of sustainable financing mechanisms, including infrastructure financing, the modernization of collective public transport and fleet renewal, and as well as robust regulatory frameworks conducive to wider opening to, to the private sector. Fifth, uh, there's also a need to, uh, th for the sustainable urban mobility plans to take into account the resilience of infrastructure, reception areas, transport systems to climate change, and also to possible uh, pandemics by learning from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Six uh, mobility measures is on the deployment of, of intelligent transport systems. Uh, also should be promoted by the sustainable urban mobility plans and, and in particular the promotion of innovative technology, uh, technological solutions such as mobility uh, as a service. Seventh, the promotion of electric mobility in cities to ensure a uh, decisive evolution in greenhouse gas emissions and noise pollution through, for instance, incentives to reduce the overall costs of electric vehicle technology, the renovation of public and private transport fleets, planning and implementation of charging infrastructure, promoting the conversion to electric buses, uh, et cetera. Eighth, uh, there is also a need to prepare for the use of newly emerging forms of mobility, and in particular for the introduction of uh, automated vehicles, even if these technologies uh, would not be implemented uh, in the near future. Ninth, the rationalization of urban logistics as also as a component of sustainable urban mobility plans, taking into account its economic, social, and environmental dimensions. And finally, it is also highly recommended to ensure effective monitoring of the implementation of the sustainable urban mobility plans. Each plan must evolve to adapt to the changing needs of the city, to monitor actions, and to adjust them where necessary. Data collection is also a basic element for this uh, in monitoring the implementation of the sustainable urban mobility plans and countries should continue their efforts in, in this regard. So uh, I'm coming to, to an end. Uh, this is uh, all in all how governments uh, uh, in UFM countries in close collaboration with their cities and local public authorities intend to promote the measures in the new RTAP aiming at making urban mobility more sustainable and, and climate friendly. We now look forward to this action plan being formally endorsed by UFM uh, transport ministers at their next uh, ministerial conference. And we hope that the new plan will guide the Mediterranean countries individual and collaborative work in the transport sector in the region in the years to come. And in this context, we wish to involve as many partner, partners and stakeholders as possible in this uh, important endeavor, included, uh, including, needless to say, the organizations uh, participating in this event. And maybe allow me a last quick word on the uh, Solutions Day, organized by uh, COP27 Presidency on Thursday 17th. The Solution Day has identified sustainable transport as a key sector providing holistic and cross-cutting uh, solutions on climate change, pollution, quality of living and efficiency, and the potentials for the sector, success stories and available opportunities will thus be highlighted uh, during the Solutions Day. This makes our session today even more relevant uh, and timely. So uh, I very much look forward to the fruitful discussions that I'm sure will take place today. And uh, I thank you uh, for your attention.
Thank you. Thank, okay, thank you, Francesc. It was a really, really great way to start. And I think it's safe to say that the Mediterranean region is really making a massive change, it's real ambition. And, and seeing a regional strategy like this is really exciting because it's, it's been clear that having that strategic thinking, looking over the whole system, not just thinking about passenger, but also logistics, thinking about the resilience and the financing in, in, a, in a holistic way is, is really important. And I think it's, it's great to see that and, and connecting it to urban plans as well as the, the, the national plans as well. So I think um, it's, it's great to see the, the ambition, I'm sure, will get even stronger for the region. So congratulations and um, look forward to seeing more about that. Please stay online and I hope you can, you can hear the rest of the discussion and we'll come back to you um, for some comments later on, if that's okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Francis. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce our panel now. I think if we should have some slides, um, if, we can, if we can get those shared as well. And um, so if I can, um, I'll introduce my, my fabulous panel here today. Um, so, so directly next to me here is Herma Musa, and she's an officer for sustainable mobility at ICLE. And you can perhaps, um, when I come to you, talk a little bit more uh, so people understand all about ICLE and what, and what you do. Um, and next, next, to, uh, next to you is uh, Maria Lafont, and, and, and she um, is the Africa lead for the International Union of Railways. Um, next to her is Antonia Hug, um, who is a Curlis Group Sustainable Development and Engagement Director. So welcome, Antonia. And last but not least um, is Philip Turner, and he's Head of Sustainability at the International Union of Public Transport. Um, so, panel, let's, let's talk about sustainable mobility, our favorite topic. Um, and as I said earlier, I think it's, it's really nice to be able to tell some really nice stories. What are the experiences that you've had? What, are you, what do you see as some really nice best practice um, and some successes that you'd like to, like to share with us today? And perhaps some of those real opportunities that you see for some real ambitious climate action in the, in the mobility space. Um, so I think I'll, I'll come to you first, Maria, if that's all right, and then to Antonia. Okay. Um, I think if we've got these slides, yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Yeah. Um, so it's um, presenting railways in the Mediterranean region in North Africa. Uh, the numbers all over for Africa is uh, it's 22% of the world surface area and 50% of the world's population. So it's great to take a train, a great opportunity. However, it's only 8% of the market share of railways worldwide and 12% uh, only is electrified and not all of it is really efficient. Uh, there are, however, a um, couple of success stories which I wanted to share with you today. Um, so one of them is uh, Moroccan, which is the first high-speed railway in Africa. It's a Moroccan railway plan which was started up in 2007 uh, to build a 1,500 kilometers of high-speed rail in Morocco. Uh, there are two axes. One is Atlantic, going from Tangier to um, Agadir, and another one is Maghreb, going from um, Casablanca to Oujda. When built, uh, it will uh, reach more than 80% of the population, uh, cover 83 cities instead of 23 at the moment, and uh, uh, up, uh, move up model shift from 8 to 13%. So at the moment, they've completed the first 200 kilometers from Tangier to Kenitra, and another 640 is on the way all the way to, um, all the way to Agadir. Another good example is Tunisian Railways, which is uh, 2,170 kilometers. Most of it is single track, and only 92 kilometers is electrified. However, they have get great projects to um, increase electrification of lines and uh, uh, making more double track lines. So that's for um, the success stories of North Africa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Antonia Hug, and I'm from Keolis, and we're a public transport operator. 
uh, active in about 13 countries and a turnover of seat, uh, seven, uh, 6 bil billion euros. Uh, but not only public transport, the classical ones like bus and coaches and tram and metro, but also, um, also bikes and even parkings, which one could call mobility at speed zero. So, uh, and when we work on, on this transformation, one could say that we push two kind of shifts. So it's the modal shift and then the energy shift. And on, on both these shifts, there are both a short-term perspective and a little bit more long-term. So uh, when we're talking about the modal shift, or the idea, of course, is to increase the attractivity of the public transport and the shared mobility. And th the basic one, of course, that's our responsibility as a doer. So that's the quality of the service, which is, of course, our everyday commitment and everyday work. But you could also think a bit further and that's not a long-term perspective, also to design the services to make them attractive. And uh, for example, we run an on-demand transport in Sydney. And uh, what is really interesting is that when we look at why, why they are taking this on-demand transport, is that 80% are connecting to the public transport network and 32% are saying that otherwise they would have used their private car. Uh, if we want to have a more long-term perspective, perspective on the push modal change, uh, of course, then it's the infrastructure. Um, so uh, we have a fantastic project ongoing in Dakar, in Senegal, right now. And uh, it's an e-electric uh, BRT, so bus rapid transport. And that, of course, is dedicated infrastructure. So then, of course, it leads to longer commitment and also investment. Uh, I have the same thinking on the energy shifts. So uh, in the short term, uh, of course, the, we need to be more sober. Mm, I mean, just pay attention to how much we consume. And maybe finally the energy crisis here is a kind of window of opportunity to, to reassess the way we work. And the second part on the short term is the efficiency. So uh, as many operators working on the eco driving, that could actually reduce the consumption up to 6%. And uh, on a more long-term perspective, we uh, go back to the uh, items that were mentioned earlier. So, of course, there is the e-mobility, which is clearly rising. Um, and we also have s experiments or uh, research ongoing on hydrogen and also retrofit. And to finish uh, on that part, it's also the energy supply. What we're doing more and more is try to also be producer of energy. So, for example, in Denmark, in our depots for the tram, we have a solar panel that uh, directly provides the energy for the depot. So that would be our thinking about how we transform and how we scale up. Um, thank you first for inviting me and as an Egyptian I would like to welcome you all here in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, to go back to your question, uh, what are the opportunities in the sector and how we can move forward? I will not uh, repeat the points that um, the other presenters stole already <laughs> in uh, terms of advancement of technology as an opportunity and also the shifting in perspectives. Uh, especially in the Global South, we have seen already what mistakes have been done in the mobility sector in the past in um, the Global North and we can um, avoid them now that we have the awareness. But I'll um, mention the uh, big opportunities that I see now with the COP27 being an African COP, uh, because as we have seen in the previous presentation that most of the indices in the transport sector, they focus on the uh, improvement of technology uh, however, this COP, we see more uh, conversations about um, mobility around people. So we see more about shifting and, uh, and avoiding mobility, especially that it's more relevant to countries from the global south. So what I want to say is uh, with the uh, regional uh, transport action plan, uh, from the Mediterranean region, we should also account for this in the uh, southern Med Mediterranean. Uh, we should take a, a, like an uh, contextualized approach 
to the southern Med Mediterranean and not just uh, copy the European approach. Um, and that's, that's the opportunity we see here with the initiatives also uh, in the sector with in COP27. Thank you, Nick. That's great. And so if we'll go to you, Philip, you've got members all over this region. What are you hearing from, from their opportunities and their best practices? Uh, thank you very much. So just in case people don't know, UITP, we represent public transport authorities, operators, but also the business supply chain in 100 countries. Um, I, think, I think we've talked about opportunities. Um, I think the biggest opportunity is, a is actually staring us right in the face, and that is getting more people onto the, the pub on public transport. Um, the modal share is, is, is not good enough, frankly, if we want to address climate change. Um, but I do think that it's an underutilised solution, and the benefits themselves aren't appropriately recognised, because... We've talked about the avoid, shift, improve approach. Um, at UITP, we've developed a methodology to actually account um, what we've called transit avoided carbon, the full carbon benefits of your public transport system. Um, so that reflects the ASI approach. So greater densities are walking, cycling, the mode shift factor, but also the congestion relief factor, getting more cars off the road. And actually, when when we've done the, the studies in, in cities around the world, um, the emissions avoided is pretty much 50% of transport emissions in the city. So that's significantly more than, than what people realise. And it actually matches exactly what the IPCC says, that um, urban emissions can be reduced by 50% with more people getting onto public transport, walking and cycling. So for me, that's actually the... the the biggest opportunity and one w what we really have to focus on because I think for me too much emphasis is is put on the improve aspect and when you consider that the, the, the public transport in a city only say is around four percent of emissions but actually it's it's through that transit avoided carbon approach and getting more people onto zero emission public transport that makes it cheaper and quicker for people to decarbonize their mobility very very quickly they don't have to save for a, an electric car or anything like that they can do it tomorrow mm -hmm. well i'll stay i'll stay with you if if if, um, if you don't mind philip just to develop that so if we, if this is urgent what we need what are the policies like, why isn't that happening already what what are the policies that can really make that shift change and sort of perhaps if you know of some policies that are starting to really work that could be replicated elsewhere? Um, I, think, I think generally you, you have to go back to the very basics. You know, that, that, that's better urban planning, strengthening public transport as a backbone of mobility, um, ensuring that it's appropriately financed, um, and, and ensuring clean energy sources. I mean, th these are very basic things, but I think, I think you have to look at sort of the role of the different governance structures. So we've talked about NDCs, and I'll give you the example of Jordan, which has um, within it a 25% goal for modal shift. And in its updated round, uh, 100 electric buses. So you've got that, that shift goal and that decarbonized public transport goal. And I think that's a fundamentally important thing that, that, that those two need to come together. So that has to be embedded in policies at the national level, but also has to be embedded at the local level as well. Um, I think the, the other thing that, that clearly um, the Mediterranean region has this roadmap. And I think it, for me, it strikes very strong parallels with the EU urban agenda, um, which set up certain partnerships around mobility which aim to which brought together member states and relevant actors such as UITP to actually work together to come up with workable solutions so I think that's a model that can be replicated about bringing together state and non-state actors that support implementation um, I think the the other important thing is about enabling we've spoken about SUMPs well I think 
one of the things which is critically important is not just about funding its delivery, it's, it's about building capacity to ensure that you have a good SUMP with bankable projects. So I think national governments can play a huge enabling role for the local level. And it's, it's really around this multi-level governance approach, which is, I think is so important. Okay, thank you. Um, Hevo, I, I don't know if you want to, to build on that, what kind of policy advice is coming from ICLE on this and what do you see as the big uh, improvements in policy? Um, I would add to what you have said about public transport and what we discussed on personal transport and walking and cycling, um, that we should uh, give more attention to uh, urban freight, uh, to logistics mobility, as also it's mentioned in the uh, regional transport plan. ECLE is working within the ecologistics community. The ecologistics community is uh, chaired by Taoyuan City in Taiwan, and uh, it's formed basically from uh, different cities in the global south, and they work together in exchange of ideas and uh, policies on how to uh, decarbonize uh, urban logistics. Uh, from uh, Taoyuan, we see uh, five different demonstration pr uh, projects that guides uh, the uh, policies regarding ecologistics. And from these policies, we uh, have uh, it, it informed us to uh, to shape the low carbon uh, action plan for urban freight (LKPUF). And with these policies, we can replicate it in different cities. Of course, we need to. Uh, see also the uh, local context in different cities because um, the uh, logistics is a really big field and uh, also very diverse uh, from a city to another uh, depends on the uh, economy of the city. So uh, yeah, I would say one area of uh, urban mobility that is also underrepresented in the sector is uh, urban logistics and with this uh, we need to have more policies on decarbonizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well I'll come to you now, Maria, if that's okay, um, and talk a little bit about, about rail. Um, there's a mic right to your left. So the policies we put forward at UAC in Africa for all of Africa, not only for North Africa, but for the rest of the continent is, first of all, strengthening territorial integration. It's um, aligned with the agenda of African Union 2063. The idea is to unite Africa from north to south and from east to west uh, to give access to landlocked countries to improve the free zone area, which is kindly b currently being developed, um, and to improve the movement of goods within Africa. Uh, another Im very important point is to ensure a high level of safety and security and uh, uh, to have standardized procedures throughout African countries uh, which are currently uh, not being put in place the way they, they should have. Mm, and for that, UAC is a great platform which can help. Um, accelerating digital uh, transformation is, of course, another important issue innovating low carbon solutions and uh, valorizing recoverable, um, re recoverable energy. So these are the five main, main points we're putting to in front for um, um, Africa at UAC. And uh, I just wanted to say about your BRT project because Senegal is one of our members and it's a great project there. I'm very, very proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you want to, if you'd like to add anything to that, Antonia? Yeah, uh, maybe. Um, so we talk about how to improve the attractivity of the public transport. Sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't also work in parallel how to decrease the attractivity of uh, options that are consuming too much or uh, too high emissions. So there is a recent example in France where it's now forbidden with flights if there is an option by train which is less, uh, which is yeah, which is less than if the train is uh, less than two and a half hour. And I think that's fair. We have the chance to have a very good network in France, but it's an interesting. Could one think about similar pl plans for urban mobility? I have no perfect solution. Uh, maybe a point of attention, though, is when you look at urban tolls or low emission zones, is that it sometimes makes the mobility a little bit less inclusive because if you have to pay to go into the city or if you have to buy a new car, 
uh, those who already had difficulties will have those have again more most difficulties. So that is maybe a, an important point for us to, to highlight. But yeah, maybe that's another way of, of answering the question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go then to my sort of last last question then, if that's all right, before we start to wrap up. Um, uh, we're here at COP. There's a lot of, there's some momentum building around sustainable mobility. And um, Heber, you said, you know, there's, we're starting to talk not just about um, decarbonizing, electrifying vehicles, but actually starting to talk about people and how they want to move around around the world, around their cities, around their neighborhoods. And um, so there's a real sort of feeling that there's, there's, there's a, a bit of a change in the conversation when it comes to sustainable mobility. Um, we know that we've heard from Francesco already that there's um, Solutions Day is taking a real focus on both cities and on mobility. Um, I'll come to you first, Philip, if that's all right, because I know you've been directly involved in those initiatives that are going to be launched this week. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about those, what you'd like to see from those, what, what, what really is there to, for us all to support and, and how we can get involved. Um, sure. <laughs> the, the point was made about this COP is focusing on sustainable mobility. Mm. I, think, I think it's a really important one. Mm. Um, I think last year there was, a, there was a huge amount of focus on electric vehicles and I, I think especially for the region that, that, that focusing on sustainable urban mobility is such a crucial thing. So I think, I think that shift in focus, firstly, um, what I would like to see coming out of these initiatives, I think, I think firstly, a very clear vision. And I think that vision has to be a long-term, I say long-term to 2030, but that's only, what, 85 months away? Mm. Um, and I think that, that makes me instantly think with linking the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals specifically, if you look at urban transport, it's about expanding public transport. And the indicator for that is around the walkability of it. So I think that, that clear vision on public transport, walking and cycling, um, that, that's what is going to come out of it. Um, I, I would also like to th see this vision invert the, uh, the transport pyramid as I like to call it, because <laughs> whenever you see like the list of priorities, you see a pyramid with like walking and cycling at the front, at the top, um, and then public transport, and then you've got this big block at the bottom of cars as being the less important. I would like to sort of shift that to have a big block at the top of public transport, walking and cycling, and a, you know a small bit at the bottom of cars. Mm. That's what I would like to see coming out of it. So my second thing, I think, is a key issue, and it's, it's often really ignored, and that's capacity building. Um, if you look at the NDCs, many countries say, we will deliver them if we have finance, the right technical skills, and capacity building. You know, I can't bring the necessary finance, but I can do the capacity building. So I think that, that, that's a really underutilized solution. Uh, and because for me, that ensures that you deliver quality interventions. And by doing that, you can create significant carbon savings from that because you're delivering quality services. We talked about a mode shift. That's how you do it. I think that the, the other important thing about capacity building is it helps to de-risk investment and so enables that uh, flow of finance that we've spoken about. So I think really things need to be scaled up in that area and, and that's really where I think the Solutions Day can play a huge role in filling a gap which we currently have. Mm, yeah. uh, perhaps Heber, if I come to you next and, and, uh, and maybe some reflections overall of what you've seen on the agenda for COP this year and, uh, and where you see it going and does it give you hope? Does it? What are the? What, what's the? Um, what do you see happening out of out of these next week and a half? Um, this year, I think there are uh, ambitious initiatives in the transport sector, 
Uh, we have the Lotus Initiative uh, that is facilitated by Slowcat. And what I really like about it, it's uh, oriented towards implementation, uh, similar to this uh, COP agenda. So it really gives the cities the chance to be proactive and catch up with the technology and catch up with the advancement of everything and then uh, really showcase the um, already formed visions and strategies or uh, conceptual side of um, urban mobility that we're uh, discussing. Uh, and there is the other initiative, the Surge Initiative. It's facilitated by uh, UN Habitat and ECLE, and it's called Sustainable Urban Resilience for uh, the Future Generations. It has five different uh, themes, but one of them is the transport sector. And what I'm really looking forward to see from this initiative is uh, the multi-level action. So it works with the uh, national level, sub-national level, and local level. And I see a strong point on fixing the organizational bug <laughs> that cities cannot uh, really um, replicate the projects but with the with such initiatives they can build capacity as you mentioned philip and they can really uh, go forward with their visions well uh, i actually wanted to give maybe another example of one of our members which is tunisia uh, which is a, a part of mediterranean and north africa and uh, uh, they have actually great projects trying to put forward their railways and create new opportunities for people and for economy and for moving goods. They are um, trying to connect uh, more regions to railways, so building new lines. And uh, uh, they're creating new lines to move phosphate, which is one of their main products, to improve movement of goods. And um, mm, also improving the rolling stock and inter-regional connection and connection more cities and people to increase model shift. So um, I think altogether there are a lot of opportunities in uh, um, in uh, the Mediterranean region in um, all of these um, great countries, and they have a lot of projects to move forward. Yeah, maybe just to finish off then. At as an operator and as a doer, what is also really important for us is to have the visibility and the incentives uh, on, on the policies so that could also, because behind every change, I mean, you have to build competences, you have been able, you should be able to ro roll out your projects uh, and that takes time as well. So yeah, ha have some visibility always important. Okay, guys, well, we've got a few more minutes before we, uh, I'll come back to you, Francesc, in, in just a few minutes. But I think just to, just to finish off this panel, maybe you could think of just some of the, um, the some key messages, just, some, just a close remark, just a sort of minute of what, what for you is um, the most <coughs> sort of important message for you here at COP um, and the sort of uh, message of hope and positivity perhaps would be a nice way to end the panel. Um, Heba. I would say the message that I can uh, leave with and also stress on is the justice-based approach in urban mobility and also the people-based ap approach um, to focus on uh, the local situation and, and what is going on in the um, local communities, their culture and their um, existing way of, uh, of commuting. Uh, we have seen a lot of stressing on the informal mobility to include it and to uh, try to interact with it. And uh, that I see as a really positive point. Well, I think the great message for railways would be for African railways to unite and uh, pro to provide more integrated approach to our railways on the continent and all over the continent. Yeah. Uh, and on my side would be to, to remember that um, urban transport has, is not sustainable not only on the decarbonization part, but the depollution um, and the reduce uh, noise, create more space, create local jobs, uh, give access to school, to jobs, uh, 
So uh, it's really a key part uh, that makes a city attractive. So that should also be taken into account. Um, I think my final key thing is, I think the, the quickest way to decarbonize transport and people's mobility is to get more people onto zero emissions public transport. And the benefits will not just be for the city, it will be for everyone and not just our generations, but also future generations. Well, that's a very nice, positive way. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, uh, Francesca, if you're still there, I hope you've been able to hear us while we've been chatting today. That I can see you there. Uh, a, few, a few reflections from you, uh, some reactions perhaps from discussions and the stories that have been shared today. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, thank you to, to all the panelists for, for such uh, interesting insight. Uh, Maybe to to pick up some of the things that have been said, uh, I, I presented ten uh, priorities, uh, ten actions that should be followed uh, globally in, in in the region. But maybe it's time to uh, choose the priorities of the priorities, uh, so to say. And and uh, maybe from what has been said, uh, I think uh, uh, it, it's true that uh, even if we are Expecting some policy transfer from from uh, developed countries to to uh, e emerging e economies, uh, uh, this uh, policy transfers has to be always contextualized. And uh, in particular, in the, in the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries, uh, although there is this uh, huge potential of, of uh, emission reduction uh, if the uh, public transport uh, ends up having a, a, a much higher model share. Uh, this means investments. Uh, I know uh, that some countries are already investing a lot. We've seen examples from Morocco and Tunisia. I know that also Egypt has a, an ambition a plan of uh, in investing in, in railways, also in, on, on the tram system in Alexandria, for instance. Uh, so this is linked to, to investment, uh, more in the southern and eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean countries than in the northern ones, so that's that's uh, an issue we will have to take into, into account. So it's good to, because uh, it seems that uh, the first thing to do, uh, according to our member states, it's to start uh, putting together these uh, SUMPs, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans. Of course, this is important. Also, the uh, the uh, the uh, transport authorities, we are working with them on that. We are working also hand in hand with the European Commission in some capacity building and technical assistance uh, in order to to assist these countries in, in putting together all, all these policies and, and, and plans. Uh, but again, uh, this in, 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 in the, the global south, this has to be hugely accompanied by, by investment. So that that's, would be my reflection. Investment, uh, capacity building, that's most needed. And we are working in in the so-called uh, Euromed transport uh, support project, which focuses also in different uh, uh, land transport issues, but also on, on urban transport and, and helping uh, uh, countries to to uh, to implement. So that would be just a, a quick reaction to, to what has been said. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, and and so I'll um, if I if I may, I'll just summarise the session a little bit as we as we close. Then it's been. It's been really nice conversation. I think it's been um, a, a different conversation as we've been having in the year before, and I think that's that's a really important change. We've heard from Francesca about the um, the strategy that's being put in place across a whole region, a huge region, and a really a, a very important region. Um, and so, and, and and so we've heard about the importance of having that kind of strategic thinking that's really across the board. So not just talking about um, switching to electric mobility, but really thinking across the avoid, the shift, and the as well as the improve, um, and, and how that's going to be financed, the importance of governance, the importance of monitoring the success, and the importance of um, a building capacity to be able to, to implement these, and, and to really be thinking about logistics, passengers, digitalizing, and resilience as well. So it's a so great start. Um, and, we, and we've had some really nice stories shared today as well, some, some points of hope um, that we can see some ambitious expansion of rail across North, North um, Africa, um, which is really transforming the way that people are moving in those countries with huge sections of the population now having access to 
to very good uh, international intercity um, transport, which wasn't there before. So real ambition to change there. We've heard about some, some the really exciting bus rapid transit as well that's really transforming some cities um, in Australia, in Dakar. So, so um, it's happening all over the place. Um, and we've, we've talked a lot about this importance of learning from the North, not copying the kind of mobility systems that we have in, in, in the global North, but really uh, leapfrogging that into a much more sustainable um, mobility system where, where public transport, where, where walking and cycling is, is the first choice um, and, and, a, and the biggest focus for, for, the, for the strands, the uh, plans across the region. Uh, when we talked about policy, it was clear NDCs are important and having real clear strategies and not just um, targets in those NDCs around decarbonizing, but also around shift as well. And so, so really having clear targets within those NDCs um, and also having policy around, um, uh, around that sort of shift um, piece. And, and things like banning short-haul flights is quite a, is quite a bold and... and and headline grabbing policy, but it really starts to send a clear message to, to people. And so how can we start to um, spread, spread those kind of ambitious um, and bold policy statements from, from governments and, um, and, and regions? Um, and, we, and we talked about this week at COP and what we can expect this week ahead. And I think um, we're all pretty excited to feel that shift in the narrative that's happening and hopeful for Thursday where we can really start talking about um, a holistic and people-focused sort of mobility um, and the way it can really um, make a change with, with real acceleration in capaci capacity building um, and uh, a shift in, in policy. So it's a great chat. Thank you very much, panel. Um, a round of applause, I think. Thank you, Francesca. So sorry that you couldn't be here in person. We, we would really like to have, uh, have met, but I'm sure we will do soon. In your, it sounds like you've got lots planned, so I'm sure we'll be meeting up again soon in real life. So thank you. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.